Welcome everyone to our first session of our Knowledge Forum Falls series. I'm Rebecca Luce Kapler, Dean of the Faculty of Education here at Queen's. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and, and just reflect with gratitude up about the lands on which Queen's University uh, it sits. Um, it is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. We try to keep that close in our hearts and in the things that we do here as we live, learn, and play. So here we go, starting this. Usually this is, a, this is an in-person conference, but we're really excited about the format this year uh, with over three weeks having different panelists and, and doing this Zoom webinar. Um, uh, of course, the theme it will be no surprise to any of you. It's teaching during a pandemic. And uh, it resonates, I think, with not only people in the education community, but uh, parents who have been teaching children and all, uh, most people. Education has been a big highlight during this time. Today, I'm delighted to tell you that we have a, a guest speaker, Dr. Andrew Campbell also known as Dr. ABC, and you'll find out why soon. Uh, Andrew is a graduate of the University of Toronto with a PhD in Educational Leadership Policy and Diversity. He's an adjunct assistant professor in our online programs here at Queen's University and a faculty member in the Master of Teaching program at the University of Toronto. He has been an ed educator for over 25 years in Jamaica, the Bahamas and Canada, and has authored two books, Teachable Moments with Dr. ABC, there you go, A Spoonful for the Journey 2015, and The Invisible Student in the Jamaican Classroom in 2018. His research and teaching focus on issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, leadership, LGBTQ plus issues, and teacher performance evaluation. Andrew's presentation is titled, Fostering Inclusivity and Belonging in the Online Classroom. I'm sure that's something all of us can really, you know, benefit from hearing. Following the presentation, he's happy to answer your questions. And just to let you know, we're gonna be using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So you can pop your questions in there at any time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Campbell. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, it's a really, really a privilege for me to be here. And thank you for having me to start one of the conversation, I would say yet another brave conversation that is necessary and needed in these times as we talk and as we discuss issues concerning um, equity, diversity, inclusion, issues concerning how we teach our students learn. And so I want to, I will be focusing on um, belonging and um, in the online classroom. And so this issue on my screen there, you see quite a bit of news clip items. I, I really wanted to start with that. So we see context of what is happening around us and understanding the, the levels of um, differences and how people are feeling about the pandemic and about being online and all that stuff. But I wanna make clear that homeschooling and online schooling has magnified the inequities that already existed. So I wanna, leave, I wanna make sure I, I leave that. I wanna make sure that I center the conversation there because I would be disappointed if people felt like they are here today to talk about something totally new when it comes to education, and that is belonging. Belonging is not a new concept. Belonging in the online classroom may have some nuances that we need to examine, but it is not strange. So what, it has, what, what the pandemic has done is magnified the inequities that already existed. So my focus is not necessarily about online as it is not new, as I said before, but the nuances. So 
online is showing the, the, the cracks and the holes, right? So online education is just showing the cracks and the holes and misrepresentation and marginalization and the lack that already existed in the face-to-face -face classroom. I put that, uh, that, that uh, slide on my Facebook. That was a post I made on my Facebook a couple of weeks ago. And I said, let us remember everyone who is online, parents, adult learners, professors, small kids, workers, many are not okay. They are not. And I had quite a bit of response on Facebook, social media, and other places. And it was not because of access. It was not because of laptops and passwords. It was not because of, of the curriculum and, and I, you know, I can't find a copy of the book online, but it was more about mental health and well-being. It was more about the lack of belonging and the lack and marginalization and people feel alone and lonely and people feeling that the colleges and the universities and the school boards are, were really ignoring the help, the help and the cries of persons. Since I've been, I've been teaching online for 12 years, and I can tell you in the, since September, I have put my game up 10%, 20%. I've turned up the dial 40%. I'm still turning up the dial when it comes to creating a climate that students feel included and, and fostering a real sense of belonging in the online classroom. So it's more than just giving them a tablet. Online education is more just about providing a tablet. Online education is more than just providing access and, and Wi-Fi and, and bandwidth. It's really about creating a classroom where our students feel like they are still being seen and heard. And as I said before, there are many challenges in the face-to-face -face classroom that our students weren't being feeling seen and heard. So how do we do that? My next slide I want to place, I want to show you. Uh, a comment from a student. I was supposed to meet one of my students and she sent me this email. My internet was lagging all day, which caused some trouble during my placement. And then it completely stopped working at 150. And I did not have enough money on my data plan to use it for, to contact you. I am someone who's punctual and professional. So I'm extremely sorry that our first meeting did not reflect that. When I got this email, it, it, it literally broke my heart because here is someone who did not have access because of situations of internet. And then she did not have enough money to put on a data plan to say, let me call my professor, which, I don't, which, which she don't need to do. But then the trauma, the hurt, the assumptions she has made, now she's, she's thinking that I am thinking she's not professional and all of these things that she's spending time to be apologetic. All of this to make sure she's not seen as being less than because of who she is. So immediately, of course, I rushed in with a response and I let her know, this is okay, you don't, no, no worry here. I have already changed the time. I'm making the accommodation. Let me know. And I gave her maybe a list of four or five different times she could meet with me. We had, a, we had an amazing meeting. So I, so I want you to understand when we talk about equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging in the online classroom, it is not about the technology. We can focus on the technology, but that's not what I'm going to focus on. You know, I am not here for a one hour performance so that we can all consume trauma and walk away with a drink afterwards and back to our regular scheduled program. I am here to ensure the conversation is alive. Keep the conversation brave about belonging, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and the push for action, whether it's face to face or in the online classroom. Bob Marley had a song, the great Bob Marley had a song. The great, as I said, you know, I, I like to make sure I stress that. The great Bob Marley had a song and it says, I want to disturb my neighbor. So I'm here to disturb my neighbor. I'm here to disturb you a bit so we can understand the urgency of making sure we create environments of belonging for our students. You know, we are, a, we, are a, we are a university and I do value the time it requires to examine and study and collect data, but we must be more intentional 
about using the data to drive change. A lot of people are collecting data right now. Every next person you meet is doing a research on online study and work through the pandemic. But I want to encourage all of us that when we do this work, we don't get the credit that we are publishing a magazine, we are publishing a journal, we are published online, we are publishing a book, we have now we have a chapter in a book, and that's it. And that is a what that's, a, that's something I want to talk about: the level of performance that we have in our universities, and then students are suffering because of the performance and not the real action of change. So we should be more than academics. Interacting and collegiality is fine. Sitting on committee and task force and other committees, they are great. But while we do that, someone is still sitting in marginalization. Someone is still sitting in exclusion. Someone is still sitting in homophobia and transphobia and Islamophobia, in hate and white supremacy, racism and anti-Black racism. And these are the issues, the real issues, why our students are not feeling a sense of belonging. It is not the, the little lack of internet access. These are the real issues. Because when they finally gain access and they are in the room, they find out that they don't belong. So yes, I am here to disrupt and to disturb my neighbor. Absolutely. So bring me to our topic, fostering inclusion and belonging in the online classroom. Um, BIS 2019 says fundamental to students' well-being is that they experience a sense of belonging in their lives. Yet in a world that offers countless ways to connect, it seems ironic that so many of our students feel disconnected and isolated. We have many ways to connect. I have, I have been in so many online platforms since March. I could list tons. And today I was introduced earlier today in I'm preparing for a talk I'm going to do in, in appeal. I was introduced to yet a new, another new platform. And with all the platforms and the access and the ways to connect, there is still a lack of belonging because this went on to say belonging is a manifestation of deep connection. I want to repeat that. Belonging is a manifestation of deep connection. I love this quote. Creating a sense of belonging isn't about being friendly or kind. It is about grasping the ways that some of our students experience a classroom as foreign, intimidating, and hostile and injurious. I, 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 definitely, I definitely want, you'll notice I like to repeat certain things. I definitely want to repeat that for emphasis. Creating a sense of belonging isn't about being friendly or kind. It is about grasping the ways that some of our students experience a classroom as foreign, intimidating, hostile, and or injurious. Here comes the beautiful part of the quote that I love. Here comes the second part of that quote. It is about providing a consistent psychological, intellectual, and emotional counter narrative. Remember that word to the microaggression, imposter syndrome, and stereotype threat that, you, that, the, that your minoritized students experience, and that by Molex 2020. So how do we create the sense of belonging? Do you know your students? Is your online classroom a space that is inclusive? Have you set the tone for an inclusive climate? A lot of times when we have these workshops and these talks, I feel educators walk away trying to figure out whose responsibility it is. I always, I always get that sense when you come to workshops like this and conversations. I feel like people look around the room when you're by yourself now, so there's no looking around, right? But I feel like people look around the room and they are keep, they're looking at, is it Rebecca because she's the dean? Is it that person because he's the associate dean? Is it that person because he's in charge? Is it that person because he wrote the curriculum? And I think we have that energy where we, where we try to figure out who is responsible for. I have some good news for you. The, 
who is responsible for I actually have the answer. It's you that is responsible for that. You, absolutely. All of us, every one of us who is on this call today, every single one of us, we are responsible for creating a climate and an in, a, a inclusive climate and culture in our classroom. One that says you belong. Many schools have great policies. I'm sure if you look at the, the, school, the, the school boards and the universities, we have amazing policies. Did anybody enjoy the suite of statements, anti-Black racism statements a couple months ago? There were statements, Gellar, you could pick any statement you want. You could just go on every single organization website and there was a beautiful statement. We weren't lacking in statement. We had, we had, we had, no, we had no lack in statements. We have absolutely no lack in statements. But what we have lacking is action. And so what happened was that when I started doing, well, I've always do, done this work. I've always done this work for years. I have written a course. 12 years ago, I've I wrote a course for diversity in the Caribbean. That was, that was what I would call groundbreaking because I put issues of LGBTQ and sexual orientation in it. And it caused a whole controversy. But this class is 12 years now. And the class is still going on, being offered by the University of the West Indies. So I've been doing this before it was in style. Because right now, blackness is in style. Did I say that? Yes, I did. Right now, blackness is in style and everybody wants a piece of that. And people are still not being intentional. It's still a part of the performance. Let you sit on the committee because black skin looks good now because we are calling for that. And should we do that? We absolutely should do that. A gentleman asked me a question two nights ago. He said to me, what do I do, Dr. Campbell, if when I start doing this work, people look at me as if I'm patronizing. I said, you won't. I said, because your work is gonna be consistent and action oriented and the results will be seen, you will not be sitting in token and check boxes. The reason why people are accusing you and some of us of checking the boxes and, and being token because we have sit there and there's no movement, there's no change, there's no growth. It's more than anti-black racism, belonging, equity, inclusion. It's more than just saying you take a seat. It's saying you take a seat, you be active. Let me hear your voice. And as a matter of fact, I did not only give you a seat, but I prepared for your coming. I hope you get that. It says, I don't, you know, we like to say, pull a chair. No, 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 pull a chair. People like to ask, seat at a table. Seat at a table to do what? To listen to everybody else speak? Seat at the table to do what? So you can, you can vote on my behalf because my voice does not matter because all you needed was a black face, a trans face, a LGBTQ face, an indigenous face, an immigrant face, a refugee face. It's more than that. It's about belonging. So on the screen there, I went to social media. I like social media. And I asked a number of persons and I asked my students, I said to them, I'm going to do a talk at Queens. When you hear, when you think of belonging, what is it? What does it mean for you? And I got the word respect. I got empathy and connection as the most common word. And of course, the, this is funny because this is also supported by research. Empathy. We need to te teach empathy more. We need to teach empathy more because that is what is lacking in our schools, in our universities, in our staff rooms, in our faculty class, in our faculty labs, and our faculty spaces, empathy. Time and space to feel emotions, diversity reflected in the classroom, comfortable to do and be, a major, major one. Flexibility, positive energy, being, fe being seen and heard. Active collaboration, connections, personal relevant, space to share, representation, flexibility. And this statement really touched me. And I asked this young lady permission to share. And she said, go ahead, Dr. Campbell. She sent this in the, in, in the box earth privately a lot of my students and other people on social media was commenting lots of comment and this one was sent to me privately 
She said, I believe true inclusion is beyond reciting the school guidelines on the first day of class. It's beyond mentioning minority identities. I'm going to repeat that. It's beyond mentioning minority identities, racial, sexualities, etc. as a side note. I find that a sense of belonging in a classroom can only occur when it's reflected in the teacher's teaching practice. Personally, I feel a deep sense of belonging in your classroom. I feel like I'm truly be, I can truly be who I am, a black Muslim woman without any judgment. Thank you for asking. And I was very privileged when I got this. I felt, I felt a deep sense of pride and joy and satisfaction, but I also felt a deep sense of humility and gratefulness. Because I'm going to tell you, a lot of persons, you know, we have heard this a million times, but I think it has not yet registered that people are not going to remember us because of all this, the, 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 the journals that we cite. No, I don't remember any professor. I have done a lot of course at the University of Toronto. I don't remember any professor and all the journals they cite. I do remember professors who have written beautiful books that I, that I, that I have but I remember mostly the contact. And I'm gonna tell you something, I'm gonna tell you a story. And for those who know me, you know a part of my pedagogy is storytelling. That's what I use a lot. In September, 2009, I'm gonna to have to tell you this story. September, 2009, I started my PhD at the University of Toronto, OISE. And I went to my one of my first classes, never forget it was, LHA 3040 by Dr. Joseph Flesher. And every time I was excited, you, you listen to me, I've been waiting for years to do my PhD. I've been waiting for years to do my PhD in Canada. I dreamt of attending the University of Toronto. I dreamt, I dreamt, literally, it's a dream come true. I want you to understand that. My dream came true. I got accepted at a couple other universities, but when I got the letter from University of Toronto, my dream came true and I was ready. Oh, I was ready. And I went in class and the first night of class, because I'm a participant, I raised my hand, I answered question, I talk. The second night of class, I did it. And every time I started talking, I sounded different. Because when I looked around the room, there was, I remember there was 18 of us in the class. Everybody else looked the same and everybody sounded the same. Everybody was using the same language. I remember the first time I heard the word coupling. I was like, ooh, decolonize. You know, you heard certain words. Those were not in my vocabulary. It was just fresh from um, the Bahamas, you know, via, fresh from Jamaica via the Bahamas. And I was, I'm a, I was an award-winning teacher. But the, the vocabulary is new. And immediately new, I felt different. And immediately the difference I felt, immediately I felt less than. Now I hear somebody maybe saying, but Dr. Campbell, why would you feel less than? You, are, you have to understand something. In our society, we have the systematic oppression nature of our society has wired all of us to immediately think when we see something different, it's less than. There goes a beautiful family. It's a man, a woman, a boy, and a girl, and they may have a dog and a cat. Fabulous. There goes two men. There goes two ladies. There goes a grandma with her, with her grandkids. Something is wrong with that family. They need more. They are lacking. It's less than. And we do that all the time with our stereotypes and our unconscious bias. And immediately, people feel they don't belong. So I'm gonna to listen to me carefully. The third class, I told myself, when I go to school today, I won't say anything because I don't know the, the, the words everybody's using because it's like a club. It's like a club. I guess they all went to the same school for their masters. I didn't know that. I, didn't went, to, I went to University of the West Indies. And immediately when I started to speak, people look at me my accent was strong, beautiful Jamaican accent. I felt a little bit funny. I wanted to make sure I could sound that they could hear me. I wonder if I should speak slower, speak more deliberately, take my, I, I want to fix me. 
so I could belong. I want you to get that right now. Write it down somewhere. I wanted to fix me so I could belong. And so I told myself, you know what? Let me go back to school next week. And let me just not say anything. And I turned up to class. I didn't say much. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say anything. I wanted to get my PhD and go. This is my first class, my second course. I want to get my PhD and go because I'm not sure if I belong. You remember, you're talking about me. I have never had a self-esteem issue. I'm not that person. I, I, I know to enter a room and take up space. I've always been this person. I'm not trying anything new. I've always been this person. But immediately, something said to me in the environment, you don't belong. And so we wonder why our students drop out. We wonder why our students disengage. We wonder why our students keep, set, keep telling our teachers, Miss, I'm not coming to school today because I have cramps. No, she don't have cramps. She don't want to come to school because you don't belong and you're trying to find ways of having less interaction. Now I'm going to tell you why I mentioned the name of the course and the professor. I got up in the in class, in that next class, and at the break time, I went to the restroom. And I was coming back from the restroom and my professor, Dr. Um, um, Joe Flesher, white guy, oh yes, he is, always eating an apple on, recess, on our recess. I call it recess, even at university, I say recess. And I was coming from the restroom and he stopped me and he said to me, are you a school teacher? And I said, yes. He said, when you explain things in class, it's very, very, very systematic. You have a way how you explain things. And he said to me, don't ever stop sharing. I went right back to the bathroom and I cried. Andrew Campbell, this me, Dr. ABC, 2009. I think it was maybe October, November by now. And I cried. And I told him the story years after and he was like, oh, I don't remember, but I've known, I know that's humility. I said to him, that evening, you changed how I felt about University of Toronto and I felt included. And even though I'm saying to you, I could feel the emotions coming back. Because and with, with that, when I cried, I went home and I cried again and I cried because I'm thinking, Andrew, if you have this personality, and you are not intimidated. Imagine all the students who decide, I will not speak in class. I will not raise my hand. I will not say anything. I will not join the group. I will not join the club. I will not say anything. I will not stand at the front. As a matter of fact, I am going to stop this course. And people are too ashamed to say they don't feel belong. So they find a reason. The school is bad. The, the building has the wrong color. The cafeteria food is not nice. The grass is too green. The bus is too, has too many wheels or something like that because we are afraid to say we don't feel belong. And that leads me to a very popular picture. So I want to say thanks again to Professor Joe Flesher and so many other professors who have made it their duty to say to my, our students, you belong. And I've gotten that as well from so many students. And I am humbled that students could say that to me. It's our job. And if you're an educator listening to me, I'm telling you, it's our job. I charge you. It's your job to create a classroom that your students feel that they belong. Come to that very famous picture about one size does not fit all. System of oppression has always been evident in the face-to-face -face classroom. This picture is not new. This is not a 2020 picture. This picture I've been using years now. I've been using this picture. You have seen it before. Many ways the pandemic has illuminated that. What is our school culture and climate? Look at this. There are people in this lineup right now who they know they will not succeed. The first day of class, they know they will not succeed. An elephant right now is thinking, how am I going to climb that tree? The fish in the bowl know he has absolutely no chance. And they start school the first day knowing they may have no chance. But something inside of them say to them, that resilience, let's push. And they live their lives in school pushing. 
and we are giving people awards for being resilient. I used to tell myself, you deserve a medal, Andrew, for being resilient until I understand, sorry, I understand more and more that in many of these cases, I didn't need to, I shouldn't have to be resilient because the institution should have been able to make me feel better and make me more able and access and give me more access and space. So many of our students, our BIPOC students, we come to a school like Queens. I tell you, I'm gonna have a courageous conversation. We are not here for entertainment. Students could attend a school like Queens and do 20 subjects or 20 courses and still not have a black professor in 2020. Let me just say this. I am, in 2020, I am the first black professor for many students in OISE and other spaces. They're first. And you wonder why we have conflict at times because there are students who have walked in the room and they see me and they didn't know I was a professor. And when they find out I am the professor, they still have to question, are you really the professor? And you get the question, where you, which school you went to? And I usually, years, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm gonna be very frank with you now. A couple of years ago, I used to spend time to introduce myself. And with that introduction, I had to use things, I had to tell people like, for instance, I'm an award-winning teacher. Or, you know, I was, I got seven awards, seven, I graduated from my, from my teacher's college with seven teaching awards. They are up there on the wall. I have been in the newspaper eight times because I'm an award-winning choreographer. I usually do those things to pad my value, to pad, so, to make sure that you, the student, gave me the same respect as any other white professor. I stopped doing that. I walk in a class, I said, my name is Andrew B. Campbell. You can call me Dr. ABC. And then I do my work. Because I'm not, what, I'm, what I've emancipated myself from is trying to make you feel better about having me as your professor. I am amazing at what I do. And we need to let our students know they're amazing. A lot of our students, they lack that. So we have to think about how we see representation in our school. I was at a school in Peel earlier this year when we could go outside and I was doing a talk about excellence and I had tons of pictures, tons. And when this picture came on the slide, you could feel the energy in the room. And when it was finished, a group of about six or eight, 68, Ijab wearing girls walk over to me. They were in maybe grade 11 or 12. They walk over to me with bright smiles. And they said, you are so good. And said, and when we saw that picture of the Vogue was like, wow, grade 11 girls, thirsty in Peel Region School and other schools to see themselves represented, thirsty to be important, thirsty to be seen, thirsty to belong. I tell you another quick story, get ready for that one. I do practicum teaching. So I watch, I went, I go to practicum and watch you know, my teachers, be, my young teachers be amazing. I have amazing students. Walk into the school and I was in a classroom and there were about six hijab wearing girls in grade five. It's a five, six split. Grade five, but I think the girls were mostly grade five. And I sat there watching the lesson. Amazing. Class is amazing. Kids are amazing. Teachers are amazing. And the teacher's white. And I, I, I did some checks and I realized the school is in Scarborough, heavily Muslim, Indian, Bangladeshi population, you know, Caribbean, African, all that population. And the staff is 85%, if not 90% white. And I know somebody's going to say, but Dr. Campbell, what does that mean? Do we need black teachers or black kids, white kids or white kids? You know, that's not what I mean. You know exactly that's not what I mean. So don't even put that in the question box because you know that's not what I mean. There's a lack of representation. And immediately I came on that night on social media. You know what I said? I long to go to a school like that with so many kids. The school is heavily immigrant, Muslim, 
in, you know, you know what I'm talking about, BIPOC. And I long to go to a school like that with so many hijab wearing little girls. And when I walk into the principal office to see someone come out to me to say hi, and that person is wearing a hijab, I long for that. Yes, that would, want, that would be one of my Christmas wishes to happen. Because our little black in Muslim girls and our little black boys need to see more examples of what they can become. And they need to see them in strength. We're talking about belonging. I'm not, I hope you didn't come here to hear about computer access. We're talking about belonging in our classroom. Our black boys and our black girls. And I hope you know when I say black boys and black girls, I am quite aware I'm speaking at a university. So don't think I'm, I have the wrong script. Because I'm using that for all of us. Our black students, all our black students, all our, our BIPOC students, our other students, LGBTQ, all of our students, our students, they need to know they belong. Yesterday, one of our leaders of the, of the Masters of Teaching program at OISE sent us a, 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 a beautiful slide of the, 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 the inclusive titles we're going to be using and encourage us to use and greetings in our classroom when we stop saying good morning, boys and girls and men. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen and all of that. We are using more, we are changing the vocabulary. We are improving, we are growing in cultural competence. So our, our LGBTQ and non-binary and trans student can also know that this classroom was meant for them. They weren't an afterthought. They weren't an addition, a sprinkle. I was doing a workshop the other day on cultural relevant and responsive pedagogy. And I remind the school, the mistake we are making is making, is making culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy an add-on, a sprinkle. Oh, it's Black History Month. Let's read a Black book. Oh, it's Indigenous Month. Let's wear orange t-shirt. Or it's something. It's bring, I told, let me tell you something. 2021, February, I want everybody to be mindful that we are going to have a turn up at Black History Month. A bunch of principal asked me the question the other day, like, you know, we are, you know, some people, some persons are nervous about celebrating Black History Month because they don't want to make a mistake. My answer to them was, there should be no mistake, mistake in celebration. How do you celebrate? You start with a cake and good music. You start with balloons. That's how you do a celebration. But a lot of us, we when we want to celebrate, we start with slavery. And that's why you're in trouble. That's why you're in trouble, because you want to start with slavery. You want to start with indigenous land and how the land came to be shared and given and borrowed and all that kind of language. You want to start with the fact that some person from Africa gave the queen of Spain some, some jewelry as a gift. It was not a gift. It was stolen. It's not a gift. It was stolen. We're talking about belonging. And if we're gonna be honest about, if you belong, then we have to be honest about the truths. We don't like the truths, we like cute. We don't like the truth. We wanna cite a journal, write a paper. You write the same paper that I write and you write the same paper that I write. And we talk to the same people. We get our data, we have moved on with our lives and we have not been intentional about action and change and inclusion. My call today is about being intentional about inclusion. And for those who don't know, this is how I teach on a regular day. So you must know that there are students who are inspired and there are students who are upset. Until I stop teaching, this is how I will teach. Because teaching is important. Teaching is 40% content and 60% engagement. I know many teachers who are the brightest teachers and they have no connection with their students. We have teachers who are bright, but you're racist. So nobody's, the students are not learning from you. You're bright, but you have no cultural competence. You are very good, you have all the A pluses from Queens and from Oids and from every single place, but you, have, but you, are, you have marginalized people every day by your very word. 
by the things on your classroom door, by how you talk to people's children, by how you talk to parents, by how you deal with certain students. So we want to talk about excellence and, and belonging and how people feel. And I put this picture there for a reason because our black students need to understand that, that they see themselves belonging and they cannot see themselves always bent over on a police car or being questioned and interrogated and treated like a child where they're powerless. Or somebody has their knee in their neck or seven bullets in the back or shot while asleep or murdered while jogging. As a professor, we have to know that we belong. I could tell you stories, stories upon stories, even through the pandemic, even in the rush of what's going on, you would believe that many of us was, was checked on by our peers. And I know you're gonna say you were, you know, you didn't know what to say, so you say nothing. We can't say nothing. We can't say nothing. You are a qualified educator. You are paid to say. You, you, you make your living by talking. Why is it that when these things are happening, you don't know what to say? So I'm calling you out on that. And I've, so you have seen this picture a lot as we come to a close. We have seen this picture a lot, everybody. And I want to encourage all of us, as we think about equity, we have seen this a lot. Many of you have seen it. If you have not seen it, well, welcome to this picture. What students aren't able to see the game in your school, in your college, in your university? I'm speaking to a wide audience because I know this, this invite was given out publicly. As you think about equity and belonging in online or face-to-face, -face, think about the persons who need the fences, who is stand on the boxes, what policies and protocols govern the boxes, who provide the boxes, who are those students sitting in the stands? Who are those students sitting in the stands? Who got tickets? What is the cost of the tickets? You know, I remember that I remember as, as a child not going to field trip because my mother couldn't afford the field trip. I stayed home. I wanted to be mindful. And then I wanted to go into implications for our practice, accountability. How can you use your position of power and influence to liberate our students? Whenever I teach white privilege, I could see where some students, they kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable. And I always say to them, you are my student. You are my student. And I'm here to teach you I am here to cut, provide you with hope. I am here as a teacher and you are my white student. I'm here to give you the best because you are going to be out there and you're going to teach kids who are othered. So I said, pull close, pull your chair close. Let us talk about how we are going to use our power, our position, our access to create space to create liberation, to make sure we have inclusionary practices. Everybody right now is latching on to the word disrupt. Every workshop you go, somebody using the word disrupt and dismantle. And of course, I'm using it myself. But what does that really mean? What does that really mean when you say you disrupt and you dismantle? What it really means? What, it, what does that really, really mean? Think about that for a minute. Inclusion and belonging. So I'm going to leave you some tips right now, everybody. Student lives experiences are valued and celebrated. They see themselves in the curriculum. Culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. You, are, you hold them to success levels. You hold them at high expectations. We are not having them in deficit. When you see them, you see promise, you see belonging. You see ability, you see a way, you see a yes. You don't scrutinize why they are there. You don't question if they applied in full or who was their reference or how they got in. 
I have always said people, when I tell people at the University of the West, University of Toronto with my PhD, I, you would be surprised the number of people who assume I was on a scholarship. Of course, the black guy in a class like this, you are on a scholarship. I paid every single dollar for my school fee at OISE. I don't owe OISE one dollar. Not a dollar. I paid it out of my own pocket. But these are some of the narratives we use. So we have to be authentically engaged. Authentically engaged. I love this song. There's a song, there's a song you can YouTube it later on. A famous Jamaican song from 1994. I'm gonna to have to tell you because it's 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 a really it's a really amazing song. Really, really, really amazing song. I love, I really love this song. Famous Jamaican song from 1994. And it's by, it's by Terra Fabulous and Nadine Sutherland. And it says, action, not a bag of mouth. Action, not a bag of mouth. It is a call to act, not just speak. And I love this song. I love it. There's a line of it that says, you think you are so fine. Stop playing with my mind. Because what it's saying is that you're using all your performances, but you are not acting. You are not making any change. Barriers to their success are identified and removed. Welcoming safe and inclusive learning environments. And I put safe in baby blue. Hope you notice I put safe in baby blue because we like to talk about safe spaces. What we really want to talk about is brave spaces. Those who serve our communities reflect our diversity, the hijab story and the school. They are not seen in deficit, our students are not seen in deficit, not just invite in the space, but space is prepared for them. I leave you with this performance and I leave you with this. Stage. This is a stage. And I'm going to encourage all of us to come to the place as educators, university leadership, whatever part you play within Queen's family. And I say Queen's family because I genuinely am going, and I say this for the last, and I've said this to people before, so it's not a new statement. I have it's it's weird, and maybe it's a testimony. I use the word testimony, the old church word. Because I teach online at Queens. And I'm being very frank and honest when I say this. And I'm not saying it because nobody paid me, because nobody can pay me to say this. I have genuinely have so many moments when I felt a sense of belonging at Queens. I remember the first time I came on the campus, my first time physically there for a, 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 a um, staff situation. I genuinely felt like I was seen, I was heard, I was appreciated. And, and let me just say this, it's not just the teachers. If I had time, I would tell you, the person who prepared my, my, my refund for, my, for, my, for my, um, my transportation, the email thread back and forth was so, was so belonging. That's the only word I can use. It was so good. It was, you, you knew you belonged. You didn't feel like you were asking back for anything that you didn't deserve. And then he said to me, oh, by the way, Dr. Campbell, just so you know, you have an account and it has this in it because of whatever, whatever. And whenever you need to use it, let me know. I, 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 the conversation by the water fountain with so many of you know yourselves, the, de the associate dean before, the associate dean afterwards, the acting, as, like literally I can, and I say this not because I need anything extra from Queens. I'm saying it because this is my truth about how I felt. And I've been in many spaces where I don't feel like I belong. So I leave that with you. And my final slide, your actions to promote inclusion within your organization, within your classroom, within your playground, within your cafeteria, within your, your transportation, within your offices, within your departments and faculty, within all the spaces must be intentional and deliberate. Years of systematic oppression is not going to evaporate. It won't. <laughs> because it's not going to evaporate. It has to be done intentionally. 
So I leave that with you. I leave that with you. I leave something with you to reflect on all of us, all of us to continue growing. I told you I am growing too because I'm realizing during the pandemic, our students need something different, something more, something extra. And I have hope that I have been one of those professors who have been very accommodating, not in a negative, carefree way, but in an intentional, genuine way. I have had students log into my class and I say to them, I see your kid. I said, put the mic on mute. I see them, let them stay. The kids come on screen, they wanna wave to the professor. I wave at them because I am aware they're at home. So your actions to promote inclusion within your organization must be intentional and deliberate. Thank you so much for listening. I think we are gonna go into a few questions at this time. There, over to me. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was amazing. It was inspiring and heartwarming. And it, it just reminded me of how powerful story is for learning. And you did that so masterfully. You, you wove stories through your presentation and personal stories are just, they just move us and, and it, they connect us to the individual telling that story. And that's such a great example of how to create belonging. It's like, come on into who I am. I'm here for you. And, and, I, and I think you've really demonstrated how powerful that is. And I, I kind of have to shamelessly say, I'm so happy about the story about your feeling about coming to Queens, because we are so excited all the time when you come to Queens. Thank you. And, Thank you. And hearing that you feel like you belong is yeah. really important to us, because we work really hard at trying to make sure everybody feels that they belong in our faculty. And uh, it's I'm really happy that you feel that way. So thank you so much. Uh, we have, I think, about just under 10 minutes for questions. And if yes. people would like to put them in the Q&A box down, down at the bottom of the screen, I'll, uh, I'll look through them and, and, uh, and ask you. Uh, oh, here, here's an easy one. Let's start with an easy one. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation. What were the names of the songs that you referenced in your presentation? <laughs> So the, so the first, the one, of the, the one of the song is, um, it's action, not a bag of mouth. So action, not a bag of mouth. And it's by Terra Fabulous and Nadine Sutherland. So that's okay. that one. Yes, yes. I was kind of hoping you'd actually sing it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a good singer. <laughs> I could direct, but I'm a good singer. <laughs> Uh, here's another question from Kathy. Um, she yeah. wonders, does everyone in the position of power and teaching in the online classroom have the capacity to figure out what their students' needs are in order to feel like they belong and like they matter? Thank you for that question, Kathy. And you know what I'm going to say? Face-to-face -face or online, you will not always have that of the total, you know, you spend time with your student. Many of us, if you are high school or elementary, then you have an entire year. Some of us, we only have a semester. But I'm gonna say this to you. Your all energy in the room, that's number one, your classroom, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, allows students to trust you. That's number one. Something about your energy that says to students, trust me. Something about how you even put your welcome up, how you, you post your messages, how you say, you know, I post a weekly message every single Monday before 8 a.m. I try every Monday in my online classes as queens to say, to sell them what's happening for the week. Certain little things in that message says I am approachable. I have put sp spring flowers. I have put pictures. I have done stuff. These are adults in a master's program, but they want to, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's how you approach them. So let me tell you what happened to Katy after that. The emails I get from students is what make me understand if they feel a sense of belonging. There are times I get emails from students and I, I, took, I, 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 I totally, like I freeze because of how much information is shared with me. And you know it's coming from a place 
I have logged onto the, my Zoom to talk to students one on one because I do the one on one at times with my student, and they are they are they are sharing with you. They are sharing to you because they are not afraid. They are not ashamed. They, there's something warm about you that they feel they can share. And once they share that, once they offer you, Kathy, that opening, you go in and you support. Once they offer you that opening that says, I, 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 I regard what you think. I respect what you think. You use it as an opening to offer more love, more caring, more belonging. You check on them. I've had students who have said to me, can I get an extension because certain certain person is sick? Now, I'm not always perfect at it, but I will give them, the, I give them the extension. And then I would say, I hope you are doing well yourself. I hope you're taking care of yourself. That kind of stuff will allow students to say, hey, you see them. So that is a way to do it. Once they open the door to those kind of trust, make sure you use those opportunities. That would be my response to that. Thank you. Now, this, this is not a question, but, but, but I think you'll want to hear it. It's uh, someone who, who hasn't given their name. They say, thank you, Dr. ABC, from a mom of a Black child navigating the bridge from high school to university. I just thought you'd like to hear that. There's lots of, can, I love you. this, I love this, and you're fabulous, but I thought that's one thank you that you might yeah. want to personally yeah. hear right now. I, but I want to say, I, I, know it's, I know it's a question, it's a thank you, but I want to say something. And I hope you heard that question, that, that comment. It's a compliment, but I hope you heard it. Mm -hmm. Navigating the transition. And navigating is, is a process of going from one place to the next. And the idea of what, how do I do it? Do I go there? You know, some, you know, when we said the navigation device, it's, it's what's the safest way to get there, the easiest time to get there, the shortest way to get there, the best way where there are no roadblocks. I want you to think about navigating. Think about if I was going from here to Queens, from where I live in Durham region to Queens. I do use, um, um, Rebecca, I do use my device if I'm driving and I find out where is the best way to go. Sometimes you're going to places you want to find out the less, less trouble the less because you want a good space. And so navigating is a, it's a powerful word because so for some of us, it's way more intentional. It's way more intentional. I give you an example, some, some things that some people don't even think about. People want a good reference. And they said, but I need a reference because I know my, my child is uh, BIPOC or black and you know she wants to get in. So I want somebody with a certain title to write that reference for me. And I say that to teachers right now and principals and everybody in the room. When people ask you for a reference, and this, uh, this, sometimes people forget there are many ways to advocate, many ways. I tell people all the while, I don't need, I don't need none of you to put a placard and walk down the street. I said, there's a lot of people walking down the street. We need other people to do other things like writing good letter of references, good letter of references, like mentioning somebody's name, standing in the gap, being that person who said, oh, by the way, I know someone, she could do this, making people references and creating access and space. So that navigate is a big one. And thank you for that. Thank you so much. I think, I think we have time for one more here. Wonderful. From, <laughs> from Lynette. Who, who asks about, um, I see many educators demand for students to have cameras on the virtual setting. Uh, how do you feel about this from an equity? Uh, oh, Lynette. Lynette, Lynette, we need a whole five minutes. Let me sit my tea, I won't, I won't take five minutes. <laughs> but Lynette, we have, Lynette, thank you for that question. It's a good question to close on. Many people disagree or some people will agree, but I'm gonna tell you this. Demanding students to keep their camera on is something we need to think about. And for me, it's a no. I'm saying that for the record, it's a no. So this is what I do. All my students know that I want to interact with them. I already tell them the power of humanization. I need to see them. What I say to them is, you don't have to keep your camera on. It's up to you to make that decision, but I already give them the rationale why I would love to see them at intervals and every now and then. And I make it a requirement, Lynette, that if they're answering a question, 
I would love them to turn their camera on because it enhances the humanization and it enhances the delivery. When they go in breakout rooms, I say to them, if you can also do that, but I already made it clear to them, you don't have to if you cannot. Not everyone has a background like mine. It's a privilege that I have an home office, but I grew up in a house, in a, in a, bed, in a two bedroom house, and I had my brother, my sister, myself, and my niece in one room. And so if I was, if, if, if I was 10, and I was a 10 year old child right now, I couldn't show my bedroom. And if I was a 10 year old child it, right now, maybe I would have one laptop and I would be waiting, and I, not maybe, I know I would have one laptop and we'd be waiting turns. Or maybe my mom would send me to the public library if it wasn't pandemic to use the laptop for school. Cause that's where I am from Lynette. That's where I am from. So when I see the idea that we are making we are making online learning as if it's something new. Go get yourself a pencil. Go get yourself a laptop. It's not the same. Internet, bandwidth, people in their houses. There are people who don't have the privilege that I do. There's nobody in my house who will, who will talk when I'm talking. Even if I'm, I'm alone, but even if I'm not alone, I have the power to say, close the office door and stay downstairs. So those things are privileges. And so for me, it's a no-no. There's no student I have who I've said to them, it's mandatory. And I've had other professors say it's mandatory and I've told them I disagree. It cannot be mandatory. However, here is the good news. I'll leave you with the good news, Lynette. And this is where we talk about belonging and trust comes from. And I've been asked this question in many spaces before. It's another new question. I will have some courses where I have 31 students, an average of 31 students. On a regular day in my online class, I'll have 25 cameras on on a regular day out of 25 cameras on. And they know it's not mandatory. They know it's not, but they have come to the place when they, when they realize I can turn it on. And I say to them, find a spot. If you're in your bedroom, find a spot in the corner, put your pillow behind you, find your little spot, go in the back room, go outside, go down, sit. wherever is a spot you can find that spot. I say to them, this idea of an office wall, that's a part of my privilege. That's a part of many of our privileges. And it's also another way is if you turn your camera on, you can use a screen, a background like you were doing, Rebecca. And a background is really beautiful to you. So there are many ways to do that. You can use a school crest. You can use a background. So no, having mandatory camera on, that's I, I, I just don't buy into that as yet because there are so many kids who cannot do that and should not be doing that. And they feel very intimidated and marginalized when they have to do that because they are on show. The home is on show. Andrew, this has been an amazing hour, as it always is with you. I know Thank I can you. just go on. I could just <laughs> go on lobbying this question, all the questions at you, because I know they'd all be have great and interesting Thank answers. You. But I want to tell everybody if you if you want to hear more from Andrew, you can check out the latest episode of our popular Podagogy podcast. He's the star of that, uh, and that link is is on our Faculty of Education website. And a few people in the in the Q and A have also asked if this talk will be available. And yes, it will be That's on our incredible. Knowledge Forum website um, at, at Faculty of Education website. And it'll be a few days because I think it takes a while to caption it. It's not straightforward, but you know, check in a few days, and um, I'm sure it'll be there. And I just want to mention that you're all welcome to join us again next week as mm -hmm. we discuss with research faculty members, Dr. Amanda Cooper and Dr. Christy Timmons, who've been doing work on the effects of COVID-19 and emergency remote learning on K-12 classrooms. Mm -hmm. I know they've got some very interesting things to share on that. And then two weeks from now, we're gonna be hosting a panel of our alumni as they discuss the effects the pandemic has had on their classrooms and schools. Um, I just, uh, and I do think that Rosalie Griffith is going to be one of our panelists. I just had a little bird tell me that earlier today. So registration for both sessions is open on Eventbrite and our mm -hmm. website, educ.queensu.ca. Thank you everybody for coming and just have a wonderful evening. And Andrew, thank you again. I can't wait to see you in person one of Absolutely. these days. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.